Hi, I'm New World Library Social Media Manager, Kim Corbin, and this is my sixth interview in our Coping with the COVID Crisis series, where I'm talking with New World Library authors about ways we can navigate through pandemic life with as much grace and presence and inner peace as possible. And my guest today is Scott Stabile. He's the author of Big Love, The Power of Living with a Wide Open Heart. He's also very active on Facebook. I highly recommend you check out his Scott Stabile Facebook page. He has become a dear friend over the years, and it's really an honor to have him here with me today. So hi, Scott, and thanks for being here. I'm so happy. I love you. Thank you. <laughs> I love you, too. And I thought a good way to start was I'd, I'd like to share a quote from your book that really kind of summarizes a lot of what you're all about and what your book's all about and kind of where we are in the world right now. And that is that nothing stands to transform us, our relationships, and the world more than a commitment to living our lives from love. And I'm hoping that you can just kind of talk about what you mean by that in a practical sense. In a practical sense in my life, what that means is that I find it important to always ask myself the question, well, not always, but often, and when I'm remembering, to ask myself the question, you know, what is love inviting me to do in this moment? Because what I find uh, energetically is that when we're operating from that energy, and when I speak about love, I'm speaking about all that love invites into our lives. So I'm talking about things like kindness and empathy and compassion and forgiveness and authenticity. You know, all of the most beautiful things on the planet, they all emanate from love. So in my experience, my understanding of our world, uh, there's nothing more powerful than love in action. There's nothing more transformational. There's nothing that stands to create real healing more than the energy of love. I ask myself the question often, um, you know, what is love inviting me to do in this moment? Because I find myself so often thrown from the energy of love, like provoked by someone or something. And naturally the way we do as human beings going to a place of of judgment and condemnation and blame and envy and jealousy and a whole host of other things that are human and okay. Um, and I feel like we're always served, one, not to deny that those things are existing because they are real and it's okay to be with whatever we're feeling, but also, or and also ask ourselves if I'm just locked in blame and rage over something. Like, well, what is love inviting me to do in this moment? How is love calling upon me to respond? And whenever I do that for myself, it recenters me back in the energy that I believe to be the energy that creates healing, that creates the possibility for real connection, for real dialogue, um, for something beyond what is created from the, um, the divisive energy of hatred and judgment and, and so much of what we see in the world, even during the pandemic, in some ways it's even been heightened, you know, which has been disheartening to say the least to see an experience, not just outside there, but even in my own being, you know, so. Yeah, it's definitely, it's like an advanced course. I feel like I, I just did it. My last interview is with Linda Carroll, who wrote a book called Love Skills. And mm -hmm. we were talking about how we deal with people in our social media feeds who have, who are really into conspiracy theories or who have different political views than we do. We were talking about specifically about conspiracy theories, but, and she said that she chooses to unfollow or block people because she knows she doesn't have the energy and that she's not an, a, a big enough soul is what she said to not feel judgment and anger. So that's how she deals with it. And I shared that I'm choosing to try and stay connected because I want to know what the other side is saying. But in order to do that, kind of my rule with myself is that I don't engage. And I'm curious, how, how do you deal with that in your own life? Uh, it's a mix, but it's, it's interesting that you're asking me that today because I have a, a, a situation like that going on with a friend of mine who's been um, posting things that are, have been provoking me to no end. You know, um, and it's funny, conspiracy theories, the word, because I do believe, I believe two things about that. 
I believe that it is very easy to target anything that lives outside of our mainstream understanding of things as a con conspiracy. And I think that, that that prohibits us from actually looking with openness and more expansiveness upon the fullness of what a story can be instead of just locking into the narratives that we're being fed over and over and over. So I believe that. I believe sometimes we label things conspiracies that it's like, this is just maybe perhaps another way to explore what we're being trained to, to think. And with that, I think there are absolutely conspiracy theories out there. I think that there are, there are understandings of things that are not rooted in anything that, that for me, if I go down the rabbit hole of investigation and research that feel rooted in anything that really aligns with my understanding of things. But even that, it's like intuitively or common sense or from a scientific or research perspective, whatever. So I do believe that exists. Um, what I, I've mostly chosen not to engage. I feel like that isn't, it's not happening on my timeline so much, but with this friend, I actually did choose to engage by way of a, a private email. And I've been sitting with it for days. Um, so I've chosen two things because I really love her and I also really respect her. And some of the things that she's been posting have felt for me so far out in left field and certainly in the context of how I know her. But I'm like, okay, I love this woman, I respect her. She's smart, she's loving, she's open-hearted. So I've taken a little bit of more of a deep dive into what would be considered conspiracy theories. And to see one, why I'm so provoked. You know, Kim, ultimately what I, what I have been trying to do more than ever in my life and in this pandemic, it's been exacerbated in some ways is to really turn the mirror toward me and really look at like what is coming up in me? Why am I so triggered by this? Why am I so angry? Why am I so judgmental? What is being provoked in me? Because that's where my growth is. That's where my healing is. That's where my work is. We can point fingers and we can put it outside of ourselves all we want. We don't heal from that. We don't grow from that. So I've been doing that a lot with this friend and with what she's been posting. And in truth, a lot of what she's been posting, it it doesn't resonate. My heart, my spirit, my understanding is a is a very like strong no to what I'm reading, not to everything, but to a lot of it. And what it's been for me more than that, it's been a no to the energy with which it's being shared. Because I think that there is a certain um, a certain self-righteousness, a certain closed-mindedness coming from people who are professing themselves to be really open-minded and exploring these new things. But if you're not awakened, to this truth, then you're not one of the awakened ones. You're one of the sheep. I say that, and also that exact energy is coming from the other side of things. And I see in myself the way in which I bring that energy forth at times in my life, my own self-righteousness, my own closed-mindedness when I'm so certain that I know. And the woman you were speaking with, it feels like she was honoring herself by unfollowing or whatever. And ultimately, I think that's a great choice if that's what you feel called to do, you know? Yeah, that, that was, was really what I, and, and in the, I put it on my Facebook wall and there was some really great discussion and a lot of people said, well, that's, you can't, you can't build bridges that way or which is their view. And it's like, I think right now, especially it's like, what's true. We have to decide what's true and right for us and proceed from there. And there's no one absolute answer. Um, and I also wanted Absolutely. to thank thank you for uh, the conspiracy theory thing because that's really true. Like it's very easy if it's not the dominant narrative to to label it as that. So I appreciate you making that distinction. And then what I had said in my interview with Linda was, where's the love and the compassion and the kindness and sharing what we believe, what no matter what that is. So I love that you brought that in too. Absolutely. Is there a way to you know you know I I'm really looking at with around the pandemic too and all of the ideas around the pandemic whether it's masks and how you feel about the lockdown and all of these different things whatever i'm feeling about it i'm really pushing myself to to empathize with the opposite viewpoint and at least to put myself in in that viewpoint as much as possible to continuously remind myself that we're all bringing to this 
whatever we're individually bringing to it. And yeah. they're, they're, I, I can make judgments and I still do make judgments about it, but I'm, I'm trying not to get so locked into my judgment and my understanding because it doesn't, for me, ultimately energetically create the potential for connection and for healing. Yeah. It creates more division. You know, it, it creates more separation and it's, it's so, it's been so ugly for so long, but it, it, it feels for me almost especially ugly now in part because everyone is grieving and going through trauma at the same time, having to just confront whatever they're experiencing in the face of this unprecedented thing, while at the same time, there's so much hatred and, and mudslinging, is that the whatever yeah. flinging what and it's just like damn what yeah. is it gonna take what will it take yeah but but kim it always it always brings me back to well what are you doing scott how are you showing up what example are you setting what choices are you making how are you taking care of yourself how are you offering love how are you being expansive in your viewpoints in your in your empathy in your compassion because it's all I have control over is how I'm showing up in the face of this just as all you have control over is how you are yeah you know but it's it's tough and in if I may I'd like to say one more thing about the ex the experience that I was having with with my struggles and my provocations with the friend it was like <clears throat> that experience of being like, we all know this experience of being the human being, but you feel like a hamster spinning around on the wheel when you're in conflict with someone in your life or provoked by something. And our minds just want to replay the same ways you would respond or think of new responses and, and how you're going to prove yourself right and whatever it is you're re and how you're provoked and how you're upset and how you're disappointed and how you're sad. And I've been dealing with that for a handful of days. It kept coming up and I, I'm like, oh my God, I'm so tired of thinking about this, you know? But it, what it was showing me is how deep these, these triggers are inside of me to look at and explore. And, and when, I, when I reflected on that, what I was reminded was that when we're being provoked in this way, when we're being triggered, when we're being called upon to go within and do the internal excavation, it's a gift and it is not wasted energy. It doesn't matter if you're spending days thinking about the same thing. If, you're, if your intention is to bring light to it, to do that deep internal exploration, like this is a gift. This, is, this will pay off. This is the work of healing. This is the work of growth. You know, we say we're here to love. We say we're here to, to evolve. Well, what does that look like? What does that really mean? It looks like showing up and doing the work and taking responsibility for how you're showing up within the context of it for me. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I feel like there's so, our, our emotions are so heightened. We've been largely in our own inner worlds for two months. And, and so all that is even more present. And I think it's allowing to, that discomfort to be and understanding that this is a roller coaster ride that we're on and that it's really about feeling all the feelings, which is, I know is something that you talk about. So would you just talk a little bit about about that, that it's not all just love and light and roses, like love is also the hard emotions too. It's all of it. It's all of it. And I think if, if, I, if I've gotten better at, at one thing, one specific thing that I feel has served me as much or more than anything in these last years, it's a real commitment to um, allowing space for what I'm feeling without, with, with much less judgment and much less need to numb. Though I still numb in my own ways at times for sure, but it's like allowing space and appreciating and understanding that like there are gifts in our sadness, there are gifts in our anger, there, there's, and even if we're not tuned into gifts or even if we're not feeling compelled to see the gifts in what we're feeling, just the understanding that the human experience is about feeling everything or all these feelings wouldn't exist and it's okay. And that if, that if I'm putting energy into denying these feelings or numbing or escaping from them, that is energy that's actually still being directed toward those feelings. And when we come out of our numbing and escaping, it's all still there waiting for us, you know? So 
it's human to feel everything we're feeling during this pandemic. There, not so much now, but in those early days, especially, I felt manic in my emotions in the sense that I felt like I was cycling through every emotion by the by the minute it felt like and sometimes or certainly by the hour I had felt like a deep peace and understanding of everything and then a hysteria and anxiety and then a deep fear and then a rage at how other people were showing up and then like a confusion about how I'm supposed to show up and it, this was like and I know I'm not alone in this because I was talking about it in my live videos and, and people were like, me too, me too, me too. It was like, I didn't, it's not that I didn't know I could feel so much. I don't know that I've ever watched myself feel so much all day and like over and over and over, like everything, you know, just cycling through. And it was like, for me, the gift in that was, it was, it was an opportunity to play witness to how expansive we are as beings, how much we can actually hold, how much we can actually make space for when we're allowing it, and that it doesn't have to take over. It's like, it's okay. If you're feeling hysterical right now, feel hysterical. You're going to move through that. It was really showing me like emotions are designed to move through us. When we're not clinging on to them with everything we've got and so committed, I'm going to be angry for the next 10 days because that's what's right. When we're not so committed to that way of existing with our emotions, they move through us. And we, we saw it. I know you saw it too. It's like, now I'm angry. Now I'm scared. Now I'm anxious. Now I'm super zen. It was, it was bonkers. Absolutely, one hundred percent roller coaster ride. <laughs> Amazing. Oh we recently went to our first social distancing barbecue with at our at Sven's friends, who was our best man at our wedding. And before we went, I had all of this emotion that came up around going and feeling like I needed to have a conversation with him about it. You know, like. I, so I called him and I just said, full disclosure, like, have you really thought about this? Are you sure you want to hang out with us? Ben works in a grocery store and, and we aren't the most pure pod in the world of, you know, like, and is that okay? It, it, it kind of felt like a safe sex conversation almost just to interact. And I was so emotional when I was talking to him, I just started crying. And I realized how much in the last two months, two and a half months, this kind of shell of protection and safety has built, a, built around me and how branching out and even just hanging out with one friend outside from a distance felt like mm -hmm. a risky thing to do almost. And, and then he talked to me about the science and when we're outside, how viral, you know, and he's, and for him, he's a single guy who's been by himself. It was like, it's more important to me to have quality of life of seeing people I love. Like I'll take the risk, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so it's just interesting that I think that's another thing that's going to be coming up is how we just navigate that with people. And do you talk about it or don't you? Or so have you, have you had, have kind of branched out a little bit and had any of that come up? Yeah. I mean, similarly to you, it's with my family. I mean, I'm staying with Goran, my closest friend and um, it's weird to refer to him like that because he was my partner for so long, but, um, and we, you know, maybe three weeks ago or so, or two weeks ago, we had dinner with my sister and her and her husband, my brother-in-law, and we were in their house and we were, I felt like we were all consenting adults. It is like safe sex talk, you know what I mean? We all knew like we're in each other's presence and Goran's a pilot and my brother-in-law's a truck driver. They're both exposed to the public. And I know what I noticed in myself was I was, much more aware that evening of things like watching like of where hands were going and stuff like that and and like just what much more aware of it all and then I, I was just up north last week we Gordon and I went up north and we were with my nephew and his wife and their three kids and my another sister and her husband and we weren't hugging and kissing but we were all eating together and we were all around each other and I didn't even really think about it. It's like, I've, I think with time, time can tend to relax things. And I felt like, you know, we're all making this conscious choice. We did have discussion about it and we're all choosing to be around each other, knowing that others are exposed to other people in the world. And, and that's, that's why I feel um, clearly inclined 
to when I go into a store, which isn't even that often, to put a mask on because I know that I'm exposing myself to other people in the world and I can't, I, who knows? Who knows if someone's carrying this? I don't really know. Like I'm not living in constant fear around it, but it's like, you don't, you don't know. And it's, it's easy. I mean, I take walks and bike rides every day and I don't wear a mask when I do that. And I feel comfortable doing that and I'm not near people. And everybody here is very conscious about getting into the street if someone's on the sidewalk. Like, you know what I mean? People are very aware. Here again, I think because this area was hit really hard early on. Um, you know, I don't know. So yeah, yeah. But it, it, it's weird. The wild, the conversations that are, are coming up and are needing to come up and more that will come up around it. You know, it's part of the reality right now. Yeah, it's very interesting. Uncharted territory. Uncharted territory. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I think it's really important for me in creating in creating peace around this is I think that there is I've noticed a camp of people who are who who feel to me like they're really diminishing the impact of this virus and really treating it as something not to be taken seriously at all while at the same time thousands upon thousands are dying from it and communities are being ravaged by it so for me that just feels um it feels, well, it feels insensitive, but it also just feels like not real, like not really being real with what's happening. So I'm not doing that at all, but what I'm seeing, what I'm doing for myself is also consistently reminding myself the likelihood of, of me dying from this thing is minuscule. Like I'm, I'm reminding myself that most people don't die from this. Most people don't even get severely sick from this. And I think that that is also an important thing to remember because I, all, I do think that there is, there is um, a profound fear being experienced by a lot of people around this and, and understandably, and I think it's important to recognize like part of that fear is being exacerbated by the fact that the media is only speaking about this and only highlighting all of the nightmarish things about it when there is an, a whole other story that we don't give any attention to, which is that most people are recovering. And yes, this is awful and most people are recovering. And yes, if you get it, there's most likely you will, especially if you're not in, in one of the um, the groups that are most likely to have a severe reaction to this. So I think it's important, again, I'm just trying to hold space for all of these realities instead of feeling like I need to deny the realness of the threat or the realness of the lack of threat. Like both, you know, can we hold space for both truths? Instead middle ground. Like <laughs> Where's the middle ground? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, instead of feeling like this isn't the point of view I'm going to get across. So I'm going to pretend that this other reality doesn't even exist. Yeah. It just doesn't, it's so frustrating. It just doesn't make sense. It's just so frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And here we are. <laughs> and, here, and, and then the work from a spiritual new world library perspective, like the work always comes back to how am I choosing to show up in this? How can I be taking care of myself within this? How can I show up in a way that aligns with my integrity and doesn't diminish other people or dehumanize other people? Um, that this is, you know what I mean? It always comes back to self, I feel like, because that's what we have control over.